my esteemed privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mark Belke. He is the Chief Scientific Officer with Creative DNA Technologies. Dr. Belke is directing research activity at IT since joining the company in 1995 with a focus on novel molecular biology applications, all nucleotide based technologies. In addition, Dr. Belke is a scientific co-founder of Desarna Pharmaceuticals in Boston, Massachusetts, and is a member of the Desarna Scientific Advisory Board. Before joining IDP, Dr. Belke was a physician postdoctoral fellow at the Howard Hughes <coughs> Medical Institute, the Medical Institute for Biomedical Research at MIT. He was a resident physician in internal medicine and a fellow in endocrinology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Belke received his MD and PhD degrees from Washington University in St. Louis in 1988, where he studied immunogenetics. Dr. Belke is an inventor of over 30 issued U.S. patents, has numerous pa pending patent applications, and is an author of over 100 scientific publications and book chapters. He is an internationally recognized expert in nucleic acid technologies and is on the editorial board of leading journals in the field, including Molecular Therapy, Molecular Therapy of Nucleic Acids, and Nucleic Acid Therapeutics. The title of Mark's first talk for us today is Improved CRISPR Editing Using Chemically Modified CRNA Tracer RNA Complexes. Mark? Well, thanks everybody for coming today. Um, I apologize for the change of schedule. I uh, had a flight delay in Chicago that caused me to miss the flight to Tel Aviv from uh, Newark, so I just got here this morning. Um, many of you have heard of IDT. We're the world's largest manufacturer of synthetic nucleic acids. We make over 60,000 oligos every day and have um, manufacturing in Iowa, in the central US, San Diego, Belgium, and Singapore. <coughs> Uh, and uh, right now around 950 employees. We've got a pretty active research group that investigates pretty much everything to do with nucleic acid-based technologies that includes next-gen sequencing, amplification methods, genotyping, synthetic biology, probe fluorescence-based systems, and all things relating to functional genomics such as antisense, RNA interference, and now the biggest range of course being CRISPR. So what I'd like to do today uh, at the onset here is talk to you about uh, the work we've been doing over the past couple of years on the CRISPR system. Okay, the uh, CRISPR-Cas9, as I'm sure all of you are aware, has just taken the biology world by storm because it's finally enabled us to manipulate genomes of living cells and living organisms. And it uses a bacterial protein called Cas9 uh, together with some guide RNAs. And what's beautiful about this is that unlike the previous effector molecules such as zinc fingers and talons, you don't have to do any protein engineering. With zinc fingers and talons, you could do this kind of work, but you'd have to spend your first half a year just making a protein that would target a specific site. Whereas here, the enzyme is constant, and all you need to target a different site and different RNA, which you can order and make as easy as a PCR primer. So the CRISPR guide RNAs bind to Cas, and then they bind to DNA, and the DNA is targeted by two things. The first is the sequence of the guide, and the second is a pan site, uh, which is sort of a, a sequence identifier for Cas9 that we're at the right area. And in the case of Cas9 from strep pyogenes, that is an NGG sequence. So you have NGG and then the 20 base sequence of your guide RNA. When it binds, it will cause a blunt and double stranded break. And following that double stranded break, one of two things will happen. You'll either repair that by non homologous end joining, and that could repair with a perfect repair so you never know what happened, or it can repair with the lesions or insertions, indels, or base substitutions. Alternatively, if you've provided a different a DNA source for it, you can have uh, pieces of synthetic DNA with homology arms that overlap this cut site that enable you to put in new material. So you can insert a new restriction site, an epitope. You can insert two KDs of a new gene. You can mutate a single point mutation. And so through this pathway, you can add new material 
and through this pathway, you can destroy it. Now, there's a lot of ways to do CRISPR Cas9. And there's no one way that's the best because there's a lot of, of different ways to do it depending upon what your application is. All that you require is that you get Cas9 protein and some kind of a guide RNA in the cell at the same time. Now, you can do this by putting in purified protein directly into the cell. You can make screening cell lines that constitutively express Cas9. You can use uh, mRNA or put it into plasmids or viruses. Likewise, the RNA can be made as a synthetic RNA. It can be expressed off of DNA or expressed off of plasmids or viruses. And the plasmid virus, particularly the virus system, is, is very handy for whole genome scale screening kind of projects. Um, if you're working with individual site targets, uh, these more chemical purified methods actually work better because they have lower off-target effects and they're cleaner. Now at IDT, we focus on two specific areas. The primary one being the use of purified protein with synthetic RNA oligos. We also make DNA expression cassettes and plasmids, but this is the system I really want to talk about today. Now when we first started uh, working in CRISPR-Cas9, uh, we've had such a large experience with anti-sensitive RNAi, we thought it would be pretty easy, because if you read about this on paper, it looks pretty simple. And the first thing we ran into with a problem was the fact that trying to express this off of plasmids was a bit of a headache, because Cas9 is very large. And you get these very large plasmids that typically have Cas9 in them, plus some kind of an expression marker that you can see if you've actually transfected the cell. And these things uh, transfect very poorly. So here's a, a transfection of just a simple HEK cell culture that's got one of these Cas9 plasmids in it. And you can see that 5 or 10 percent of the cells are actually transfected. Now this is a small EGFP plasma, and you can see that normally we're used to getting, you know, 90, 95 percent transfection. But you don't get that with these things. They're very ineffective. Now if all you're trying to do is get a mutant cell and you can grow that mutant out of this rare population, then this will work. But if you want to study anything in more bulk culture, or like what we wanted to do, which was optimizing RNAs and studying the efficiency of the system, this is useless. Because if you double the efficiency of the RNA, you can't tell that from a slightly better transfection. So what we did first was make a cast uh, constituent of cell line in HEK. And it has a single integration event. It makes one to three mRNAs per cell. And this is a Western block. You can see the low level of protein expression that's constant in it. This high level of protein is what comes out of a plasmid. And what's kind of scary is that this large amount of protein here comes from that culture. And so this huge overexpression of proteins only in five to 10% of the cells. Now, in any given cell, you have two targets. And so you really only need to have two molecules of Cas9 in there. And so if you have these huge amounts of uh, enzymes, and if it has RNA with it, what it's going to do is, is mischief. It's going to do off-target effects. And so while these kind of methods can work, they are very prone to off-target effects. And many of the early papers in the CRISPR field vastly overestimated the prevalence of off-targeting because they were using these plasma overexpression systems. So all the uh, initial work I'm going to show you is done in this kind of cell line. Now, if we're going to do serious studies of CRISPR-Cas9 in a high throughput way, obviously the most accurate thing would be DNA sequencing. But if you want to do, you know, Sanger sequencing, well, heck, how long does it take to clone clone the site? You know, that's, that takes too long. Don't get that many sites. <coughs> NGS will work. Fabulous data from NGS, but if I do a CRISPR uh, experiment, transfect on Monday, harvest the cells on Wednesday, um, it's two more weeks before you got NGS data back. Um, so what we've been using is a T7 uh, heteroduplex mismatch assay. The way that works is you harvest the DNA 48 hours post-transfection, and then do PCR around the cut site. And then after PCR is done, you do a final heat cool to allow the PCR molecules to form heteroduplexes. 
So you've got wild type uh, binding to wild type, uh, mutant binding to mutant, and then you've got wild type binding to mutant, or if you've got different mutants, you'll have different mutant binding to different mutants. The key, of course, is that you create these bubbles and mismatch endonucleases like surveyor, uh, T7 endo, will recognize those and cleave. And that cleavage event is easily detectable. Now, you'll immediately see the weakness of this in that um, this is always going to underestimate the amount of editing that's occurred because the enzyme won't always recognize single base indels. But even further, if a mutant binds to a like mutant, it, it's not a mutant, it's a homoduplex and it won't cleave. So this is always going to underestimate, but it's still a very useful high throughput tool for this kind of model. And here's what it looks like on a general. This is a walk through an exon of HPRT where we're just looking at different PAM sites. And just like anti-sensor or NAI, there are good sites and there are bad sites. And so you can see sites here on this agarose gel, or even better on this capillary electrophoresis trace, where you can see sites that are cleaving with high efficiency and then sites that are not. Now, this is an instrument we like, which is called the fragment analyzer. It's a 96 capillary CE instrument, so you can do this all at 96 well plates, your transfections, your DNA preps, your PCR, your T7, just all processed in the robot on the plates, and then feed it into this, and it'll do a plate every hour and a half with quantitative data. So it's a really nice system to use. Now, what is the correlation then between the T7 data and the um, sequence. So we, we took a number of these sites from here and just cloned them and did Sanger sequencing. And what we found is there was a general crude trend of about 2 to 1. So about 20% at the T7 level and about 40% at the DNA level. And that's just a crude correlation. Any given site could be different. But it gives us sort of an idea of how to interpret the data. Now, there's two ways to go about uh, using CRISPR um, guide RNAs. The natural system has evolved in bacteria have uh, a CRISPR RNA, which has a 20-base guide domain called a protospacer that links to a 22-base arm that binds a constant uh, RNA. This constant RNA is called the tracer. It's much larger. It's 89 bases. And this mediates the binding to Cas9 and this directs the sequence specificity. So this is how it's done in bacteria. Back in 2012, the Genic Dalton paper described uh, development of a single guide, wherein these are now fused into a single piece of RNA. So it goes from the protospace or around right through the tracer. This is about 100 bases long. And it's very convenient if you're doing this as a transcription unit. So if you're making this off a of plasma or a virus, this way, you only have to have one uh, expression unit. And you can liken this to uh, RNAi with shRNA versus the natural siRNA. So the natural siRNA in a cell is the two, two RNA strands on top of the bottom strand, whereas an shRNA is a hairprint pin, which is, again, convenient for single uh, expression transcription units. So if you're working off of plasma or viruses, this is obviously the way to go. If you're going to work with chemically synthesized RNAs, you can make these. But 100 bases long is kind of at the outside range of chemical synthesis for RNAs. Whereas these guys are shorter and are much easier and cheaper to make. So it's this area that we focused our initial work on. So the first thing we wanted to do was to study uh, if these could even be shortened further. Because you know, when it comes down to oligosynthesis, especially with RNA, shorter is going to be higher quality and shorter is going to be cheaper. So we wanted to see how short we could go. And so we trimmed off from the ends and then we tried to delete the mills. And not surprisingly, we were able to trim some off and at a certain point it stopped working. But what we saw really did surprise us. We expected that the natural length compounds would be the best, but they weren't. So this here is the natural 42 mer CRRNA paired with the 89 mer tracer. And as we trimmed it, 
we reached a peak here at a 67 base tracer paired with a 36 base CR that showed higher activity. Now, we don't fully understand why these shorter species should work better. Um, but part of that I rationalize as being that these are the isolated factors put into mammalian cells and in their natural use in bacteria, there's all kinds of other proteins and factors that are, that are in play with the system. And so in mammalian cells, these shorter compounds actually work better, which is fantastic for us because not only then are these going to be easier and cheaper and faster to make, but they actually work better. This is what some of these studies look like. So here's the T7 readout with the truncation. And you can see as we, uh, at some point it got worse and then it got better and then it got worse again. And the other thing I want to point out is that within the um, tracer RNA loop domains, deletions were totally failed. They killed it. And these loops, these folds, mediate the binding of the tracer with Cas9. And importantly, the tracer doesn't just bind Cas9, it activates it. And so Cas9 itself in its native form is inactive. When it binds tracer, it unfolds in what they, the crystal structure people call the clamshell. So it opens up. And that opening up provides the access of the enzymatic cleft to invade the DNA. And so these areas here you can't delete because they're involved with uh, cast iron binding and a a functional activation. Now, what about shortening from the other end? Now, we've shortened and shortened on the universal part. What if you shorten the gut? And that was of interest to us because uh, Keith Young from Mass General published a paper saying that shortened guides had higher specificity. And that was really quite interesting to us. So we studied a lot of sites looking at 2019, 18, 17, and he was promoting 17 MERS. And what we found was that 19 MERS and 20 MERS worked well. But when you got to 18 MERS, many of the sites started to show compromised function. And at 17 MERS life, most of the sites were dead. And so yes, these short guides do show less off-target activity, but they unfortunately also show less on-target activity. And I think the reason that they worked okay for Keith was that his lab was using uh, plasma overexpression. So they were putting in so much of this stuff that even if it was inefficient, they got it to work. But that's also why they had such a problem with our target effects, was there was so much overexpression that you were hitting sites that weren't, weren't appropriate. So we're recommending to people that you stick at 20 to 19 for the guide domain. Other groups have published that you need to add GGs to the end. And having an extra G at the end makes a lot of sense if you have an uh, artificial transcription unit. But if you add Gs to the end to chemical RNAs, one G is tolerated, but two Gs hurts activity. So if you're going to work with chemical RNAs, just use the sequence that's in nature. Don't add this other stuff at the end. Now, we wanted to compare the function of the single guides with the chemical units that we were working with. And while we can make these hundred mers, they're slow and very expensive. So we thought we would just make in vitro transcripts. And if you read the literature, there's a lot of labs right now who are making in vitro transcripts as their primary way of doing CRISPR. So we, we did that. We put a T7 transcription unit in front of the sgRNA. You can make these as little mini G blocks, very trivial, cheap, uh, very easy to make uh, in vitro transcribed RNA from. But when we put it in the cells, we were seeing a lot of this. Normal cells are healthy. The cells transfected with our chemical two parts were healthy, but a lot of these cultures, the cells were half dead or even fully dead. And it, it kind of confused us because there's so much stuff published with these things. And what we, after talking with customers, what we realized is 
most people weren't looking to see if they had cell death. And they, they didn't realize this was happening, that they were killing half or two thirds or three quarters of their cells. Um, and if you end up getting a gene edited cell line out of this that actually survives, well then I guess it worked. But you're doing a lot of damage to your cells. And if you go back to the basic biology of synthetic oligos and cells, you actually should have expected this. Because it's a long-standing problem in functional genomics, whether you're antisense, RNAi, or what have you, that human and all mammalian cells have got an innate immune system. And part of that innate immune system are receptors that recognize foreign molecules as viral or bacterial and immediately trigger an immune response. So you've got your adaptive T cell, B cell immune system that we all think of mostly, but you've also got an innate immune system that doesn't evolve with antigen. It's fixed receptors that respond to things that the cell is supposed to know are bad. And these kind of long single-stranded unmodified RNAs are bad. The cell thinks they're viruses. And so if you look at these cultures, if you just look at a, a splicing factor, they all look about the same. But if you look at an uh, interferon response gene, the cultures transfected with the in vitro transcripts all have a huge induction of the interferon pathway, whereas the ones transfected with the chemical RNAs don't. And there's two things that are well established from RNAi uh, in particular which is that shorter RNAs don't trigger as well, and chemically modified RNAs don't trigger as well. Now your own body has got all kinds of highly folded structured RNAs in it, ribosomes and tRNAs, so why don't you just respond and your cells just kill themselves? That's because these are highly modified. And in particular, 2 methyl RNA is a chemical modification that's present in your own RNAs that prevents these receptors from triggering a response. So if you do modification and you use shorter RNAs, you don't see this effect. So we then went on to, to more fully study the two-part chemical system <clears throat> and to develop an algorithm that have looked at over a thousand sites. And what you'll see is that a lot of these things actually work pretty well. I mean, these are, these are working great, and then that one doesn't. These are working great, and then these don't. And so for the most part, these things work well even without an algorithm. Um, and that's really quite gratifying, and it's really very different from antisense and RNAi, uh, where you really do need an algorithm to find the, the most active sites. But uh, we've developed a, a support vector machine, sort of an artificial intelligence program, that enriches for active sites that we hope is going to come out on the web within the next few months. The more important part of that is the off-target algorithm. Because, you know, if you just take any three sites, if you look at these kind of plots, two out of the three are going to work. It's just the statistical likelihood. But the off-targeting is the more important thing. And if you just blast the site, you don't really get a good interrogation of its matches in the genome. You've got to have a different set of algorithms that are far more complex that allow you to look at the whole 20-day sequence and not only look at mismatches, but also allow for indels. Because a single base deletion or addition is equally compromising as a mismatch. So that's another big part of a good um, algorithm that will be coming out, as again, like I hope in a couple of months. So what about chemical modification? Now, I've talked about that. Um, should it be done? The, the answer is absolutely yes. And this is just basic oligochemistry. Anybody that's worked in antisense has known for 30 years that you've got to chemically modify oligos, otherwise they do bad things themselves. And you know, people that worked in RNAi first tried to use unmodified RNAs. And when you got into normal cells, primary cells in animals, they always trigger immune responses. You know, your standard HeLa cells, many of these are compromised, so they don't have intact immune systems. And so you might not get a bad effect using unmodified RNAs in a HeLa cell. But if you go into more normal cells, you're going to have problems. So we began to look at chemical modification for two things. 
One was to block immune responses. The other was to stabilize against nuclease attack. You put a single-stranded RNA into a cell, it's got a half-life of five minutes. And you've got to have some kind of modifications on it that help it to survive nuclease attack. And there's two things that are going to help you there. One is going to be structure, the other is going to be chemistry. For structure, these things have got these hairpins, and they're bound to protein. So you've got structures that are protecting them. But then we can add chemical modification on top of that and further help protect them from nuclease attack. And in fact, there's been a couple of papers published that looked at that, one of which you've heard about uh, just earlier today. I want to understand that uh, Professor uh, Handel was here, uh, who had been at Stanford and is now here, um, opening up his own lab, who described, first described use of chemical modifications with long S genomes. So we began to systematically evaluate how you could modify these. And it's actually a pretty complicated question because these uh, chemical modifications change structure of RNAs and also they, they put blocking groups, if you will, where normal amino acid contact points might occur. So you may have an amino acid contact with the 2 prime hydroxyl. You put a 2 prime methyl or an alanine or a 2 prime fluoro at that position, it disrupts that contact and kills function. So you've got to, you can't just willy-nilly modify these things. So here is an unmodified RNA, and you can see it's got good activity. You make the whole thing 2 prime methyl and it's dead. But interestingly, what we found, kind of unexpectedly, was that you could modify very large blocks of this RNA and still retain high function. And as you begin to do systematic mapping, you can define individual residues that kill function. So as we do a single base walk here and start adding more levels, you go from active to almost inactive to dead just by the addition of a couple of bases there. Same thing happens here. We're doing a walk this way. And if we walk, it's fine. And then one more base, boom, it's dead. And so by doing these kind of walks, we can map the residues that have critical contact points and know where you can modify and where you can't modify. Likewise, on the CRRNA, the same thing is found. Uh, unmodified works, fully modified doesn't. We can try to do it in blocks, and in this case that didn't work. Uh, two prime fluoros didn't help. So we were forced to go through these more systematic walks, even in a more extensive fashion. And again, likewise, you can see here how the addition of one methyl group kills it. Here, the addition of one methyl group kills it. And to make a huge amount of studies simplified, Here's kind of a map. So the red here are the bases that we can modify with 2 prime methyl. And the black are the residues that we have to keep as RNA. Some of them are a strong kill. <coughs> Some of them are a weak kill, smaller arrows. But they're additive. And so if you do a couple of weak kills, they add up to a strong kill. So you can really heavily modify the tracer. The CRRNA is a little more complicated. In the constant region, you can modify almost all of it except for these three U's right here. In the dye RNA, it's actually a lot more complicated because this sequence changes with every site. And unfortunately, the effects of structural perturbations by these chemical modifications varies with sequence. And there's no good way to predict that. So we can say that this domain of the CRRNA is relatively easy to modify. But this domain is not. Uh, there are a couple of residues that are truly bad, but the rest of them you sort of have to test individually with every different sequence. But fortunately, for most research needs, you don't need to do that. That you, you don't have to have these things modified nearly to this extent. You can do half this amount of modification 
and it still gives you full benefit. So what we've done is mapped these sites so we know how highly we can modify, but then what we've done is dial that back to a level so that you get the full benefit of the modification, but yet we've created compounds that were easy to make and therefore not too expensive. Because if we start making compounds that are this heavily modified, then they're going to get a lot more expensive and they're going to take longer to make. Now, the final piece of this puzzle is the protein. You can put it into a plasma or a virus, like I said, but you get vast overexpression. And the best thing you can do is actually transfect protein. So you can bind the RNAs to the protein and deliver that directly in the cells. And you can put that in with some cells with lipid. And with other cells, electroporation. Uh, yet other uh, things you can use direct microinjection. Now, we've been a long time advocate of use of the protein. But it's always been a problem because the people that sold protein were selling it for ten to $15,000 a milligram. And at that price, you can't use it. You know, it's just too expensive. So we started making the protein. Uh, we did a lot of optimization work on it, and now we've got a version that's got three different uh, nuclear localization tags on it. Uh, very highly purified and also very concentrated. It comes with a 60 micromolar stock, which is about uh, 10 mg per mil. And what that means is that it's, if you want to change the buffer, it's very easy because you just dilute it. And uh, so whatever your application is, um, this very high concentration makes changing your buffer trivial. The other thing we found is that it's more stable at high concentration. So this stuff you can actually store for a couple of months at four degrees in the refrigerator and it doesn't lose activity. But if you have it at lower concentration, it'll die. And what we're, we're selling it now for as low as one-tenth the cost of what some of the original vendors were selling their stuff for. And what that does now is it enables use of the RNP system, where you use RNA with protein as your primary method to do CRISPR. So it's really simple. You just take the um, guide, the CRRNA, and anneal it for the tracer. Now, theoretically, you should be able to just mix these together and it would be like eight. But we found that about one out of 10 sites do better if you do an honest to God uh, heat anneal. So heat it up to 95 and slow cool it, and then that one out of 10 sites that would otherwise not work will work. Then after that's done, mix it with the protein and then pop it in the cells. Again, lipid transfection or electroporation. Lipid works. If you can transfect RNAi into a cell with RNAi max, you can transfect RNP. But good news with that is you use one-tenth the amount of reagent if you're doing lipid. The bad news of that is it's a restricted number of cells that you can use. And it's also variable. I mean, sometimes it works really well, and other days it doesn't, and we don't know why. Electroporation allows you to work with a much larger variety of cell types. It uses 10 times as much reagent, but it's much more robust, and when we do that, it tends to work the same every time. So we're beginning to favor electroporation, and in my lab, we're using the NEON system from Thermo, which allows for single-use, small-volume experiments, so it's pretty economical, or the ANAXA system, which is very friendly for high throughput because it's got a 96 volt plate attachment. Here's an example of that. So here's looking at RNAi max going into just basic HEK cells. And you can see great results with RNAi max and every other lipid we tested didn't work. And so there are a number of places that sell lipids they say work for this. In our hands they haven't. So right now, the only lipid we use is the RNAi max. Thermo also sells a CRISPR max reagent, which, to the best I can tell, is just a slight variant of RNAi max they charge more for. So we use the RNAi max. It works just as well. The NEON is a fantastic uh, platform. And it allows you to fully vary the, the voltage, the pulse duration, the number of pulses, even this wave shape of And so you can fine tune a, if you test all the different variables, 
you can get very high cell viability with very high um, transfection efficiency with it. And you really have got to optimize it for every cell line. The Amaxa works, and you can get good results with it, but we find it a little trickier because it's black box. You don't get, it has programs, and you don't know what's in the program. And so you kind of got to just use their pre-made settings and hope that they work. You don't have the same flexibility. So depending upon what we're doing, we'll either use the Amaxa or the Neon. But if we have the luxury of doing something Neon compatible, we prefer that because of the flexibility of the system. Now, if you look at the going now into a ribonuclear protein uh, nucleofaction experiment, what you'll see is the unmodified RNAs work, but the modifieds work better. And if you do the sort of the dose comparison, we're getting similar efficacy at 10 micromolar unmodified as 3 micromolar modified. And so that's showing in these kind of cells, um, which are easy cells, the uh, benefit that you get from chemical modification. And this just increases as you go into complex cell types. So HEKs and HELAs, you know, they're easy. You start working with primary T cells, you start working with primary hematoblatic cells, the chemical modifications are absolutely essential. Here's another interesting thing we stumbled across. Uh, we noticed when we were doing electroporation uh, with HDR templates that we were getting fantastic efficiencies. And then we, when we started and took, took out the HDR templates, our efficiencies went way down. And what we realized was that the single-stranded HDR template was causing the electroporation to work better. And what we, we believe, this is sort of a bulk carrier effect, that it's dragging the RNP into the cells with this highly negatively charged uh, RNA. It doesn't work with uh, tRNA, and it doesn't work with short DNAs. So we, we like to use about 100 base oligo of something that has no sequence homology to the organism you're working in so that it can't integrate. Now, we've been using that trick now for a year, and just recently, last month, Jacob Horn from the IGI published a paper about the use of uh, stimulant DNAs to improve electroporation. They think that it's causing stimulation of the repair pathways. But um, in our NGS experiments, we don't find any difference of the repair pathway products. All we find is that they're more efficient. And so for in our hands, in our experiments, we, we agree that the carrier DNA stimulates electroporation, but we're, our data don't agree with the mechanism. But at the end of the day, I don't think it matters, because either way it helps. So here's our data on that, where here's with carrier DNA, we're getting this kind of an NGS pattern. And uh, without carrier, again, not as efficient. But if you look at the fingerprint now, um, what we find is that the fingerprint of the products made are identical. They're just more efficient with the carrier. And this is, this is also an interesting concept, that a individual CRISPR site has a fingerprint. It has a spectrum of repair products that characterizes that site. And if you do that site over and over again, you get the same spectrum of products out of it. You do a different site, you get a different spectrum of products. So this site here has a bunch of different products in it. You may find another site has almost only a single base addition. And that addition is usually the same base. At a different site, it may be a different base. But again, it's a fingerprint. And Caribou uh, recently published a paper about that, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, other groups have also published about the benefits of using the ribonuclear protein complex. And so here's 
uh, uh, this paper actually came from Thermo. And they're looking at two known off target sites, comparing plasma with cas mRNA with a protein. And you can see that the off target effects go down as you shift the protein. And that correlates here with the duration that Cas9 is in the cells. So plasma is the worst with long duration and high amounts. mRNA is lower amounts, but it has a longer duration. Whereas protein is very fast on and fast off. And that's why we think that the RNP system has the least um, off targeting. Now, in our hands, this is what it looks like. So here is a two, uh, either done in the Cas9 cells, where you have very low continuous expression of Cas9, or with the RNT system. So this is a site that was published by Keith Young. And in his plasma-based experiments, his level of off-target effects was this high. Now, in our Cas9 cells, it's a lot lower because it's not as overexpressed. But it's still pretty high because Cas is continuously there. If you go to RNP, on the other hand, the relative amount of off-target effect is very much reduced. So we're a big fan of the RNP system for its specificity. Now, let's, let's put this in the context of how it really helps our customers. This uh, data is an experiment that was given to us by a pharmaceutical company um, well over a year ago, where they were doing primary human T cells. They're working on ex vivo manipulations for patient reinfusion. <coughs> and their sort of tweaking system for this is the knockout T cell receptor so that's an easy thing where they can study the loss of the T-cell receptor by CD3 marker on the cell surface. So they'll take out the, they'll get the T-cells from human donors, stimulate them with CD328 beads, then they will uh, transfect with the neon system uh, the, the synthetic RNAs with either Cas mRNA or Cas protein. Now their whole system was optimized for Cas mRNA they uh, added the protein at my request, uh, but I told them to use uh, three to four micromolar, and they used one micromolar. So their results aren't as good with that as they can be because it's lower on the dose response curve. But this is what they found, and it's really very illuminating. So with the Cas mRNA, with unmodified RNAs, they got nothing. If we just modify the CRRNA, they got nothing. If we just modify the tracer, they got nothing. But if we modify both, now suddenly 56% of the T cells were missing T cell receptor. When we went to the RNP, we actually see some activity with the unmodifieds, and that's because the protein is providing some protection of the RNA. Also, with the Cas mRNA, the RNAs have to be more stable because they have to survive in the cell while Cas protein is being made. So the RNAs have to be more stabilized if you're using Cas mRNA in the protein. And uh, I think that the RNP system with the dual modified is going to be the, the best way to go for the T cells. Now, in other systems, like the zebrafish, people are using this uh, RNP system extensively, you can micro-inject so much material and they don't have an innate immune system. So the unmodified and the modified work just as well. And that only makes sense then because you can inject mass amounts of it, works fine, and you don't have an immune system. But here in C. elegans, now, you're not directly micro-injecting into the cell. You're injecting into the gonad, and then the RNAs and the stuff has to survive to get into the target cells. And in their case now, in the C. elegans system, the unmodified RNAs work, but the modifieds work hugely better. Now, you've heard earlier about the chemically modified sgRNAs. Um, our short stuff, 
I mean, we could make these in a, in a, in a couple of days or a hundred bucks. The chemically modified, it takes us about two weeks to make them and about 15 times the cost because we have to make a very large prep and highly purified. But you can make them. And this is what they look like. They're 100 base oligos that have chemical modifications on each end. Um, and these are mass specs, a lot of spray mass specs showing that in fact you can make RNAs this long that are exactly correct. And in these kind of cell lines, like we use, um, they work the same as our short two-part. Two now, we hear from some customers that there are primary cell types where the long sgRNAs work better. And I think these are cell types where there's going to be a more nuclease-rich environment and the additional structure of the more highly folded sgRNA is perhaps better. And I think it's a case where um, the sgRNA is in fact a good product, but it's only one you should use when you have to because it's so much more expensive. So there are going to be cases where you actually should use it, and you'll only know that by trying. Um, and there may be publications that come out in the literature that will help guide you as to what cell types should be used for that. Now, HDR is another area of active optimization. Um, this paper came out from Corn and the IGI suggesting that asymmetric um, HDR oligos uh, work better. And we've tried, uh, we use for basic HDR and IET, we use the Ultramers, which are an ultra high quality single stranded oligo that can go up to 200 bases long. And we look, we're looking at length of the arms necessary and look at whether you need to stagger them. And these assays are all done simply by putting an equal or one site into the cut site. And if you look at this, what we're finding is that the symmetric and the asymmetric kind of all work the same until you get really short. And so we didn't see that there was really any advantage to using asymmetric. Now, I don't know if anybody out here has tried that and found that that actually helps or not. I, if you have, I'd enjoy hearing about it. In our case, in the studies we've done, um, it didn't give us any advantage to add that complexity to the, to the design. And all we found was that we needed to add at least 30 bases of homology arrow on each side. And so typically we'll use anywhere from 30 to 50 bases of homology arm on each side. Any more than that is just a waste of money to order longer oligos. But if, you're, if you've got 30 to 50 bases on each side of the cut side, you should be doing okay. Now, this is uh, one, one thing I forgot to mention here, is that if you just grossly look at R1 sites, you would think that double-stranded uh, DNA works fine too. But that's not good stuff. There's bad stuff in here too. And if you look at the products, you get two things that come out of the, the double-stranded DNA. One is going to be an HDR product that you want. One has got double sets of things. Because this is this is with single strand. You get the desired product. This is with double stranded, and you get two sets of products. One is the desired product, an HDR event. The other is blunt insertion of that double-stranded fragment into the breakpoint. And that's not what you want because that whole thing is now crammed into the slot. And so it's not the product you're looking for. It's introduced on our one site, but it's added far more uh, changes to the um, locus than you want it. So if you're using oligos, use them as single strands. Do not make them double strands. Now, you say, what about something long? Because I can't, you can't get a thousand base oligos. Well, there right now you're kind of stuck using plasmids at low efficiency. We're working on a product where we can make long single-stranded DNAs. And these will be made from plasmids um, because the fidelity of our photosynthesis above 300 just is, is too low to use for this kind of application. But I think sometime in 2017, we're going to launch a product that will allow single-stranded 
uh, um, single stranded non circular DNA product, products for HDR as long as 3 kbs. Um, and right now we've got data test sites looking at these things, and the results have been really fantastic. Another thing I want to point out that's a practical tip on this is that a lot of times when people are doing experiments with this, you know, the old thinking is always, well, if a little's good, more must be better. But the reality is that as we add too much of the HDR template, it gets worse. So here we're looking at, this is the total editing efficiency of the system by T7. And this is the fraction of those events that have the new R1 site put in. And around 3 to 1 nanomolar, when we're working with 10 nanomolar liposuction, gave optimal results. And as we went up higher, it got worse. So when you're doing optimizing your HDR events, don't just add a bunch and then run with it. Do a little dose response testing and don't be afraid to start on the low side because sometimes that's going to work better. Now, what about other areas? Everything I've talked about so far is the streptiogenes Cas9. Um, there's Staph aureus Cas9. There's mutant Cas9 with new cam sites. There's hi-fi uh, Cas9s that have reduced our targeting. Uh, and then there's entirely different systems like CPS1. Um, we have, are working on a hi-fi system. And at first, we've started to use the Young system. Keith Young had published these mutants that had amazingly low off-target effects. Well, unfortunately, uh, they also have very low on-target effects. And they worked in his Nature Biotech paper because they were highly overexpressed using plasmids. But if you use them as RMP, they don't work at most sites. So we're working on our own mutants that will have good on-targeting as well as better off-targeting. But they're not going to be ready until 2017. But the area that's going to come out sooner is CPF1. And CPF1 is really interesting as well. Whole other CRISPR-Cas system from a different bacteria. And there's two things about it that are really neat. One is that it uses a single short RNA. You don't have this long combination of a CRN tracer. It's a single RNA that can be as short as 41 bases. And it also uses a PAM site of TTTN. So now instead of being restricted to G areas, you can get AT rich areas. So if you're trying to target an area of the genome that's AT rich, this gives you an option. If you're working in organisms like falciparum, this gives you an option. So we started to study that, um, and it's very different. This is a, a walk across an exon using Cas9. And you can see that most of the sites work. And this is what I call the ski slope plot, so it's just plotted worst to best. And it's a great way to look at you know, the relative activity. This is the sites plotted across the exon. This is the same exon now looking at the CPF1 sites. And now you can see that half of the sites don't work. We don't know why. But we've now done this in four exons, and we see the same thing in all of them. And there are clusters where they're not working well. But remember, this is just linearly across genomic DNA, and these things aren't necessarily really that close to each other. So for Streptiogenes Cas9, you can just pick a few sites and chances are it's going to work. For the CPF, you're going to have to look at a lot more sites. And so while we've got an algorithm coming up that will help with this, where you don't really need help, um, I think the algorithm is going to be really important in this, but it's going to take us probably another year to generate the data and validate an algorithm before that's available. But we've got protein made now of this, and the protein works well. The RNAs work well. We've well into optimizing the chemical modification of these. It's far easier because they're shorter. And if things go well, by the end of the year, we should have CPF protein and RNAs available too. 
So anyway, that's where we stand right now with our CRISPR work. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people in my lab who did most of the work I, I showed today. And also uh, thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Great talk, thank you very much. So you mentioned some data with the CFP1 and we know that the break which is generated by this enzyme is not blunt, it's sticky. Yeah. Do you see any effect on the homologous accumulation for people assume that there is no preference over there? We are doing those studies now and we don't have enough data back to comment. I can tell you that one effect of having the asymmetric cut site is that the T7 data and the next-gen data are much more similar. And so it makes our T7 data almost as good as next-gen data. As far as the HDR goes, ask me again in uh, three months. Okay, well thank you and I guess we'll move on to the next speaker.